Thank you very much, Mark. Am I, I think my mic's on. Well, it's been a treat to be here for these two days to share in your celebration of a hundred years of uh, this institution, quite a, quite a milestone. Um, I can't promise that I'll be back for the second hundred year. Uh, <laughs> I may be traveling somewhere else at that point. Uh, this afternoon, what I'm going to tell you about is a work in my laboratory in the recent years on uh, two aspects of how cells transport unusual molecules. Uh, the first that I'll talk about is how cells adapt to large particles that would not normally be accommodated by the carriers that convey normal proteins through the secretory pathway. I'll focus on one example, a very important one, that affects uh, uh, human function, and that is uh, collagen. You'll see in a moment that collagen has to have some special adaptation for it to be um, accommodated within the cell. And then I'm going to talk about something that um, is uh, particularly interesting to me now and I think will occupy my attention for some years, and that is, uh, it turns out cells secrete RNA, not just proteins, and they secrete it in little vesicles called uh, exosomes or, or extracellular vesicles. And these exosomes obviously have some important function in normal biology, but they may uh, be diagnostic of certain disease processes. And as you'll see, there's some reason to think that exosomes and their RNA content may play a role in pathology. And uh, that's, of course, very interesting, I think, for a lot of people here. And uh, it's interesting to me, just as a basic principle, how I'm interested in how cells work. And uh, naturally, when you learn something about how cells work, it often turns out to be useful in understanding how, how things go bad. So let's start with a description of uh, an, a normal part of the pathway that cells use to package proteins that move in the first station of what is referred to as the secretory pathway. So here's a cartoon uh, of the early stages in the packaging of proteins that are assembled in the endoplasmic reticulum. The process begins by the recruitment of a small GTP binding protein that uh, assembles on the surface of the membrane oops, called the endoplasmic reticulum, and it uh, um, recruits two cytoplasmic proteins to form a complex that diffuses on the cytoplasmic face of the ER and encounters by collision different membrane proteins, some of which are designed to be packaged into transport vesicles. <clears throat> a proper fit is made. That uh, packaged material is assembled through the action of a scaffold complex that has the ability to self-assemble into a polyhedral cage that literally envelops and pinches a transport vesicle by a budding mechanism from the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, in all cells, all eukaryotic cells, these transport vesicles, coated vesicles, are usually pretty small, maybe only around 80 nanometers in diameter, which is more than big enough to accommodate most membrane and soluble secreted proteins. But some things are too big to be accommodated by this means. For example, lipoproteins or virus particles that uh, flow along this pathway. We've been particularly interested in collagen because uh, it forms a rigid triple helical rod in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum that extends to a diameter of over 300 nanometers. So how is it that something that big could fit into a <clears throat> small vesicle, particularly since it isn't so flexible? Well, there are two possibilities. One is that maybe for things like that, there's a different mechanism, a completely different pathway. I don't think that's the case. I'll present some evidence that shows you that the normal pathway is employed for that purpose. <clears throat> or there's some way uh, to adjust the polymerization of that coat so that it can uh, maybe uh, conform to a larger uh, sphere or, or, or rod so as to be able to pick up a particle of the size of procollagen. <clears throat> the evidence that we have, and many other labs have, that supports the role for the normal pathway in the secretion of collagen comes from a quite chance uh, collaboration that we had with a clinician at Johns Hopkins who discovered through uh, a collaboration of his uh, a Bedouin family 
in Saudi Arabia that has a rare craniofacial disorder with a mutation in a, a conserved residue of one of the subunits of the coat that's responsible for traffic from the ER. Very surprising <clears throat> that such a mutation would conserve, uh, would, would show up in the clinic. Uh, you'd think it would be fatal. It certainly is fatal in yeast when we isolated that mutation in the first place. But it turns out that humans have two copies of this gene, and only one of them is, uh, in, uh, is functional in the c certain tissues that sustain growth of the skull. And so these patients have a disorder in skull morphogenesis, but it's not fatal. Anyway, you can culture fibroblasts from uh, kids with this craniofacial disorder, and we did so and compared them uh, to fibroblasts, normal fibroblasts, in this uh, immunofluorescence image. The top panel show, on the left shows uh, immunofluorescence using an, a an antibody against a protein that is normally housed in the lumen of the ER, shows the reticular network extended to the leading edge of this uh, fibroblast. These cells also have transit forms of procollagen being processed for secretion, and the two are completely coincident, as you see in the merge on the right. Now, if you look at cells from the patient with this uh, disease, the ER is hugely distorted. Uh, it's bloated up much bigger than normal. It uh, forms these large vacuoles, which fill with the luminal marker as above, but also which accumulate procollagen. Procollagen has a particularly difficult time being secreted from these cells. And, and, and yet these patients are, uh, uh, can, can, can grow to maturity, though they, they clearly have a disease. Well, so that is one of uh, a number of pieces of evidence that this pathway, this COP2 coat, is involved in packaging collagen, but it sort of begs the question, how does it happen? So we struggled, actually, for some years to figure out a way to solve this problem. And um, I'm going to tell you about a collaboration that we've done with a colleague of mine that shows some promise. But during years of frustration, uh, I, I became completely obsessed with this problem. And, and on a trip to Vanderbilt University, I took the morning to wander around in their sculpture garden, and, I, and once again obsessed with the issue, I found that an artist had the same obsession, because here you see a polyhedral network attempting to envelop a rigid rod. Um, I'm sure you see that this is the same thing that we've been studying. And if I fail eventually to uh, explain this, perhaps the artist will be able to help me. Well, fortunately, as uh, fate often has it, uh, a young colleague of mine by the name of Michael Rapa uh, was studying the role of protein modification called ubiquitination and its role in various aspects of cell physiology. And a graduate student in his lab, Lingyan Jin, focused on a particular uh, family of ubiquitin ligases called the Cull3, Cullen3 family. Um, this is responsible for ubiquitilating hundreds of different target proteins in human cells. And it does so by invoking one of several hundred different adapter subunits, each of which is designed to pick out and ubiquitilate, modify some target for some purpose. Uh, Lingyan found that uh, the major subunit of this ubiquitin ligase, Cull3, and then one particular adapter subunit called KLHL12, when knocked out, caused, caused mouse embryonic stem cells to round up, to lose their adhesion, and apparently um, all because of a defect in the elaboration of the extracellular matrix. Well, that didn't have necessarily any bearing on what, on what we were doing until she found that the uh, specific subunit, the ubiquitin ligase subunit in, in, impl implicated in this uh, issue, has as its target the major subunit of the coat responsible for forming transport vesicles from the ER. Further, she showed that when you take that subunit and you express it in a surrogate cell line, like a HeLa cell, the cells accumulate giant COP2 vesicles. Here's an example of that. So here's an immunofluorescence image of cells stained in three panels with an antibody against that 
adapter subunit. And the protein marks puncti that get to be pretty large, a micron or two in diameter. But most interestingly, these puncti align completely with antibodies that decorate different subunits of the COP2 coat. So you see in the bottom the alignment of these two immunofluorescent labels. And some of the images clearly de 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 decorate uh, circular structures. And you'll see in greater detail that these really are giant vesicles. Kanika Bajaj, a postdoc in my lab, decided to collaborate with Lingyan to see if these giant vesicles could somehow facilitate the secretion of collagen from cells. And she did so by taking a cell line that is prolific in the secretion of collagen and transiently transfecting that cell line with a plasmid that allows the cell to produce more than its normal supply of this ubiquitin adapter subunit. So here is an example of such an experiment where only a fraction of the cells have taken up the plasmid, and yet after just 30 minutes, these cells already are exporting, in this case, uh, procollagen from the cell. Whereas cells transfected with an empty vector or with a mutant that Lingyan identified that fails to transfer ubiquitin to the subunit of the COP2 coat, in both instances during that 30-minute incubation, little if any collagen is detected in the growth medium instead retained within the cell. So that was a piece of evidence to support uh, our suggestion that this ubiquitilation event somehow facilitated the formation of giant vesicles, which could then accommodate collagen and speed its exit from the cell. Now, we published this uh, a few years ago, and uh, we had, uh, quite unusually, a, a kindly reviewer who uh, gently overlooked the fact that we had not firmly established that these giant vesicles actually house the procollagen that is being secreted from the cells. But we didn't, uh, th this had not escaped our attention, and we focused for now, uh, we focused for a couple of years to try to understand how these vesicles could actually capture collagen. The problem that we had was the antibody we were using to diagnose the presence of collagen within the cell was not up to the task. We needed a better antibody, and so we surveyed a variety of uh, now monoclonal antibodies and have found two that do a better job in identifying intracellular deposits of procollagen. Let me run through a few slides to, that where I hope to convince you that we can now demonstrate that collagen is in these giant vesicles. Here, for instance, is a panel showing a single cell, the cell that is prolific in the secretion of collagen, labeled on the upper left with an antibody against the subunit of the coat that gets ubiquitilated. You see these puncti, several arrows here. The, uh, a number of these puncti, but not all of them, align perfectly with an antibody against procollagen. And the alignment is highlighted by these arrows in the bottom, uh, bottom image. Uh, we've also created a cell line in which we can control the expression of this ubiquitin adapter subunit. And such a cell, when turned on uh, for just a few hours, produces these puncti that label with an antibody against the adapter subunit and which coincide with an antibody against the subunit of the coat and also, in some cases, with an antibody, this monoclonal antibody against procollagen and the aligned images of these puncti are shown by white arrows. Well, that was, um, that was comforting, but now we wanted to have a closer look. We wanted to be able to show, to convince ourselves that these giant vesicles were actually uh, transport vesicles unconnected to some organelle, not just a budding event, but actually a free giant transport vesicle. Then further, to have a closer inspection uh, at a higher level of resolution of the coat that may surround the membrane. And for this, we needed electron microscopy but we needed to be able to identify vesicles in cells first at the level of fluorescence and then at the level of electron microscopy. And that, for that, we, we turned through the efforts of a terrific graduate student, Amita Garur, to a very painstaking procedure that I myself could never have done. It's called uh, correlation fluorescence and electron microscopy. Here's the technique. It's amazing that it works, but she got it to work. You take marked grids with little indications, uh, little numbers and letters that allow you to go back and find 
the position on a grid that you start at, and you simply uh, culture cells on that grid, and then the, the sample is fixed gently, subjected to a gentle permeabilization to reveal uh, content exposed to a fluorescent antibody, so that you can then say, okay, here's, a, here's an organelle that I want to be able to inspect later on by electron microscopy. This sample, having been identified in that way, is then subjected to further fixation, dehydration, embedment, and thin section, the way that one normally processes a sample for electron microscopy. And um, if, you, um, you know, if you have a clean living uh, life and uh, you, you, know, you work hard, you can actually go back and find the very cell, indeed the very organelle that was initially visualized at the fluorescence level, but now in, in a thin section in the electron microscope. I, I'm still amazed that this works, but here is a panel of images showing uh, Amita's success. The, f the first panel on the upper left is a, a low magnification view of a bunch of cells labeled with two different fluorescent antibodies. Focus in on this one cell labeled with an antibody against the coat subunit. Uh, the same cell labeled with antibodies against procollagen. The merge shows that a number of these giant puncti uh, have both labels associated with them. Uh, then uh, the sample having been processed and, uh, for electron microscopy, Amita was able to go back and find, in several cases, the very same cell that she had seen at the level of fluorescence, and here is that cell. She then uh, zoomed in and examined the organelles by, uh, at the level of the electron microscope and could see an example, many of one, um, one of many, showing the image containing both procollagen and the coat subunit and here it is, that's the organelle, about a micron in diameter, a giant vesicle. We can look more closely and see a kind of a fuzzy cytoplasmic coat on this structure. But further, she could take this specimen and uh, have sectioned it serially to obtain a number of slices through one organelle. And that image is shown here. Uh, remarkably, here is a set of concentric slices through that one organelle showing that it is a free, giant vesicle unconnected to any other organelle in the cell. This is a powerful demonstration that this structure is an intermediate in the traffic pathway and that it houses procollagen, which can be seen here uh, by a kind of a granular staining material. Well, okay, we're, we're pretty sure this is, um, at least at, at this level, an explanation for what's going on, but it isn't really ultimately satisfying. What we want to understand eventually is how uh, the presence of a ubiquitin chain on the subunit of the coat changes its polymerization so as to create this giant vesicle. And for that, we have established or adapted a cell-free reaction that we devised years ago uh, that allows us to recapitulate in the test tube the formation of a transport vesicle. And um, Lin Yuan and Satoshi Baba in the lab have found under the right conditions, that they, they can reproduce in the test tube the packaging of procollagen into a, a coated transport vesicle. And so uh, with that kind of a, an approach, it will <clears throat> eventually be possible to tease apart the biochemical requirements for the formation of that vesicle. In it, it will require, in addition to the coat subunit, some additional machinery that controls the attachment and possibly the removal of a ubiquitin chain. So we're, we're going to go after that and um, continue to be persistent. OK, now, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you about another subject uh, that is uh, truly unconventional secretion, and that is the production of these uh, so-called exosomes, or extracellular vesicles. They, they, um, they can be obtained from a variety of metazoan cells. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, one particular source, HEC-293 cells, human embryonic kidney cells. They uh, can be produced by cells growing in culture. They are detected in circulation in the, in the serum of patients, normal patients or disease patients. Uh, they carry certain membrane proteins. We'll talk about one particular one, an integral protein called CD63. 
But for our interest, they also appear to carry small RNAs, a variety of small RNAs. And uh, they're interesting both in normal and in pathological states because they may convey these RNAs from one cell to another between organs, between tissues, and control gene expression by delivering uh, a small RNA, like a microRNA, to a target cell. Now, I, have, I should caution you that though this has, claim has been made in literally thousands of papers, the evidence that these things actually convey information is not so good. And there are reasons why I, for instance, am not entirely persuaded. One of the reasons, as you'll see, is that people who've studied these exosomes have not generally purified them and characterized them molecularly. So here's a standard kind of uh, protocol that you see in even what I refer to as luxury journals, or maybe especially in luxury journals. People will culture, let's say, a tumor cell line and take the conditioned medium and centrifuge that at 100,000 G and call that pellet fraction exosomes. Well, if you look at that material, by any means, it is crude. There are a variety of different membranes of different sizes, and there are a lot of things uh, that aren't even in vesicles. There are ribonucleoprotein particles that sediment at 100,000 Gs that are, have nothing to do with vesicles. So we had to focus our initial efforts in developing a rigorous procedure for the purification of exosomes. Now let's talk, before I show you that, a little bit about what's uh, known about, oh, I see, I probably had the wrong slide there. Yeah, okay, here is, a, here is an exosome, uh, kind of a cartoon of an exosome. Uh, it has a typical bilayer. Uh, it has certain membrane proteins, of which one I'll specify. There are some cytoplasmic proteins that appear to be enriched, but again, for our interest, they seem to have some small RNAs. Now, here's one idea about how these things may be made in uh, a mammalian cell. <clears throat> there is a pathway in all eukaryotic cells where uh, cell surface receptors that have done their thing become internalized and ultimately degraded in the lysosome, first becoming associated with a structure called an endosome, and then internalized into the interior of the endosome through an invagination that results in what is called an intraluminal vesicle. These structures mature then to form organelles called a multivesicular body. These have been seen for decades and are known to deliver membrane proteins to the lysosome for degradation, for turnover. However, it turns out that some of the multivesicular bodies uh, also fuse at the cell surface, and when that happens, the intraluminal vesicles are discharged to the cell exterior in a kind of a bolus, and they could go and uh, possibly deliver content to some other cell. But I should also emphasize that it's equally plausible that this is simply another way that a cell has to get rid of things. It may just be exporting these vesicles to get rid of them, and that remains a viable possibility. But why would they bother to package certain small RNAs if they were just trying to get rid of them? That's the question. Well, so what we decided to do was, uh, I had a terrific student join the lab, Matt Shirtliff, and uh, as I indicated a moment ago, our task was we wanted to purify a particular exosome species to a very high degree so that we could characterize its content with some precision and confidence. And so here's a procedure that we developed to purify one species of exosome from HEC-293 cells. We start with conditioned medium, as always in these experiments, but centrifuge to low speed to get rid of large membranes. We collected small vesicles at a high speed and then resuspended the pellet fraction in a high concentration of sucrose and sedimented this sample to equilibrium, with, uh, which allows membranes, which are buoyant, to float up. And we found vesicles marked by this protein, CD63, equilibrating at a position between 20 and 40% sucrose, separating it from other membranes in the initial fraction. Um, we then 
wanted to further purify this material, and so we immobilized antibody against CD63 on beads uh, that were mixed with this interface fraction, and then the vesicles that have CD63 become associated and then can be centrifuged at very low speed. Now, we've also developed a way of following CD63 quantitatively without having to rely on a uh, qu quantitative, without having to rely on a qualitative immunoblot. What Matt did was he fused the gene for firefly luciferase uh, to the three prime end of the gene for CD63, creating a fusion protein with luciferase at the C terminus. And luciferase is a very potent enzyme is readily detected uh, at, uh, with exquisite sensitivity and allows us then to quantify the distribution of the fusion protein in cells. So here is the purification procedure uh, showing you that there is a progressive increase in the specific activity of luciferase at each step in the purification. So clearly uh, there is additional purification uh, from going from one uh, one step to, a neck, to the next. Further, we could show, Matt could show, that RNA measured chemically associates with vesicles that bound to CD63 antibody beads seen here in the bound fraction, whereas a control IgG attached to beads bound no such RNA when mixed with the, um, the uh, density gradient fractionated vesicles. So there clearly are vesicles that have CD63 and also have RNA associated with them. Now we can probe uh, in a really simple experiment exactly how luciferase is oriented in these exosomal vesicles by a very simple principle, uh, an enzyme latency assay. Uh, the predicted topology would have luciferase in the interior of this vesicle and if you isolate the vesicles and mix them with substrate, the substrate for the enzyme is, uh, the substrates are ATP and luciferin, neither of which can uh, diffuse through a membrane. The prediction is that these vesicles would not hydrolyze substrate, and indeed they don't, or very little, unless the membrane is dissolved with detergent. And sure enough, there's a big stimulation in activity on addition of Triton X100. It also it turns out, is, it'll be important in a moment, that the enzyme exposed in the presence of detergent is exquisitely sensitive to proteolysis by trypsin that you see here. Okay, now, having convinced ourselves that this was pretty pure material, we decided to evaluate its content of a particular small RNA, microRNA, and so Matt did a deep-seq microRNA analysis and found roughly 600 different species in the HEC-293 cells from which these exosomes are produced. And then he looked within the purified exosomes to see which of them are, uh, are enriched in, in that purified vesicle fraction. Here is a survey. Uh, about 10% of the RNAs found associated with HEC-293 cells are um, enriched to some degree in exosomes. But only a few of them are really highly enriched. There are three here, one of which you'll hear about later, called MIR-144, several hundred-fold enriched. And then there's one that really stands out called MIR-223 that turns out to be a thousand-fold enriched in exosomes. That suggests, that degree of enrichment suggests that the process of biogenesis of exosomes and the acquisition of RNA is a very selective event that probably involves some RNA sorting. Sorting possibly mediated by a signal, a nucleotide sequence on the RNA, or possibly by some selective stabilization of that RNA in, in contrast to the fate of MIR-223 in the cytoplasm of the cell. We followed two of the enriched microRNAs during the course of the fractionation and showed, as before, that the specific RNA activity increases at each step in the purification scheme for both MIR-223 and MIR-144 to similar degrees. We showed further that both RNAs are inside the vesicles. They're not sticking to the outside because both RNAs 
are completely resistant to ribonuclease added in the buffer in which the vesicles are suspended unless the incubation is conducted uh, in the presence of Triton X100, at which point both, vesic both vesicles, the vesicles rupture and the RNA is exposed and degraded. Okay, so there's enrichment, there's specificity. Now, of course, the challenge for us is to figure out how this works. What is the mechanism? And in my lab, the way we almost always pursue this is uh, by the development of a cell-free system reaction that allows one to reproduce in the test tube a molecular process. And the virtue of that, being a biochemist, is that means once you do that, you can tease it apart, isolate the relevant molecules, and then have the hope eventually of putting them back together in pure form to understand molecular mechanism. That is how biochemists uh, do their thing. So Matt took up the challenge, and he devised an assay, a reaction, that I'll uh, describe in two forms. One we call a biogenesis reaction, and that's shown here. Uh, so at, we take these cells, HEC-293 cells, uh, expressing the CD63 luciferase fusion, and we break them mechanically. We centrifuge to isolate a membrane fraction and, and then a supernatant fraction with cytosolic proteins. And we mix them back together in a test tube with uh, ATP and buffer. And we ask, do new exosomal vesicles form in this mixture? Well, how do you detect such a thing? You know, what if it's a rare event? How do you detect it? Well, here's an idea that we cooked up that allowed us to detect the production of latent luciferase during a 20-minute incubation at 30 degrees. The principle is very simple. We start with this lysate containing membranes, endosomes, and at the moment of rupture, we guess that there'll be some vesicles that are already formed inside the cell, and they will be sequestered in the interior of this organelle such that luciferase will be inside the lumen of a vesicle further inside the endosome, clearly inaccessible to substrates for luciferase that, would, that were added to the buffer in the incubation. So this enzyme, this fraction of the enzyme, will not act on substrate. It can't. It's not accessible. Of course, an awful lot of the enzyme will still be on membranes exposed to the buffer on the limiting membrane of the enzyme, or even in other membranes in the lysate. And those molecules will readily hydrolyze substrate. Uh, perhaps a small fraction of luciferase will be, in a way, caught in the act of becoming swallowed up into the interior of the endosome. And if that event captures substrate from the buffer to be internalized into the interior of the endosome, the luciferase may continue to act during the course of several minutes of incubation. So how to distinguish these vesicles from the uh, abundant luciferase that just is present and remains on the surface of the endosome? Well, here we rely on the fact, as I showed you a moment ago, that this enzyme, when it's exposed, is readily degraded by trypsin, whereas anything that had been internalized into the interior of the endosome you would predict would resist trypsin because it's not exposed. So you do the reaction, shown here, in the presence of substrates added to the buffer. You centrifuge the membranes, wash them with buffer, and then expose the intact membranes to trypsin under conditions where exposed luciferase is, in a way, shaved off. And what is left behind are the small number of vesicles that may have formed that enclosed substrate and can continue to act to produce, in this case, photons, which is the product of the luciferase reaction. So it sounds more complicated it is than it is. You do what I've shown on the slide. You process the sample. You plunk the sample into a luminometer, and you simply measure the production of photons and hope for the best. Well, it worked. And here is a sample. The signal was low, but detectable and, and reproducible. We set the signal of a complete incubation to 100% for comparison purposes and show that if the incubation uh, is conducted in the absence of cytosolic proteins, which would be necessary to, you know, for biogenesis, the signal is very much reduced. If the reaction is conducted in the presence of detergent, 
so that the membranes are just dissolved, there's virtually no reaction detectable. Or if a parallel sample is simply held on ice under conditions where membranes really can't do transformations, little, if anything, is detected. So this gave us some confidence that we're measuring something, perhaps the formation of exosomal vesicles. And if so, then maybe if we added microRNA to the incubation, we could watch and see its incorporation into vesicles that form in the test tube. And so Matt devised at the same reaction, only measuring the packaging of MIR-223. Same incubation, but now we add ATP because these events often require energy, and chemically synthetic mature MIR-223. The incubation is conducted as before. The membranes are washed and now exposed to ribonuclease so as to degrade anything that hasn't become sequestered during the 20 minutes at 30 degrees. The membranes are then lysed by detergent, the RNA amplified and quantified by QT-PCR. It worked. Here is uh, one of the first experiments. About close to 7% of the microRNA that was added becomes sequestered in a ribonuclease resistant manner after a 20 minute incubation. That same reaction held on ice produces little uh, detectable, protected RNA. The protection absolutely depends on having had cytosolic proteins present in the incubation. It also depends upon having membranes present, and it is greatly reduced, nearly eliminated, if the membranes are dissolved with detergent, as you see in this panel. Now, as I said, such reactions, these kind of biogenesis reactions, often require ATP, hydrolyzable ATP, and if we omit ATP from the incubation, the signal is reduced about twofold. Likewise, if the enzyme apyrase, which hydrolyzes ATP, is added, the reaction is reduced. Or if a non-hydrolyzable analog of ATP is provided, the signal is reduced. Still, it's above a background of a signal held on ice. So there's something going on, but it is stimulated by hydrolyzable ATP. OK, well, still. What is this, does this really, what we think it is, is it really a biogenesis reaction or just some RNA is getting trapped somehow? If it's simply nonspecific trapping as opposed to exosome biogenesis, then you would expect that the same thing would occur if you added a cytoplasmic microRNA and compared the efficiency of its becoming protected to the efficiency of MIR-223 becoming protected. So this was really the crucial experiment, and it worked. Here is one simple comparison. MIR-223 packaged in this incubation now, about 9% efficient compared to an incubation held on ice, whereas a cytoplasmic microRNA, one that is not secreted in exosomes, MIR-190 is packaged very poorly in the same incubation. If you look at the rate at which these events occur, the rate at which MIR-223 becomes packaged mirrors the rate at which luciferase becomes latent in the biogenesis assay, whereas the rate at which MIR-190 is protected mirrors the low rate at which luciferase becomes protected in an incubation held on ice. So there is a time and sequence and energy and cytosol and membrane-dependent event. Now, if this really is measuring the uh, uptake of RNA, then perhaps some cytosolic protein is necessary to recognize that RNA, an RNA binding protein. And if so, it should be possible to fish that protein out after the completion of a packaging reaction using a tagged form of MIR-223. And here, Matt did that. He did the same incubation that you've seen in several forms, now using a biotinylated form of MIR-223 so that this tag, the biotin tag, could be fished out on a streptavidin bead after it had been, become incorporated um, in vesicles. So after the incubation and after ribonuclease treatment, the sample was dissolved in detergent and the detergent-soluble material exposed to streptavidin, which binds uh, um, uh, biotin, and 
of the biotinylated MIR-223 then adheres to uh, the beads, and then by mass spec analysis, we can see what proteins are pulled down. There were several prominent RNA binding proteins that uh, went through this analysis, but the one that stood out the most was a protein that had half of its sequence represented in different peptides in the mass spec spectrum, a protein that had already been described to have various roles in RNA metabolism in cells. But for us, the most interesting uh, literature uh, on this protein was a, a report shown here that characterized this so-called Y-box-1 or YBX-1 protein as secreted in vesicles by cultured cells. So here we see uh, in this, pro this paper that the YBX-1 protein uh, in the medium is resistant to protease unless that reaction is conducted in the presence of detergent, just as I've shown you before, is characteristic of vesicles and their housing of, uh, of RNA. So that was encouraging. We obtained a polyclonal, very specific antibody against the YBX1 protein, and we're able to show, as you'll see in the next slide, that it, sure enough, is in the vesicles on the CD63 antibody beads, along with other proteins shown by these other bands that are characteristic of exosomal membranes, uh, but distinct in this case, uh, in one respect, a, a different membrane protein that's been reported to be in exosomes is not bound to the beads at all. Maybe this represents a different exosome species produced by HEC293 cells. So it's there. Now the question is, does it go in to vesicles that form in vitro? <clears throat> and uh, this was a simple experiment. Again, the same experiment that you've seen before, a complete cell-free incubation with biotinylated MIR-223 conducted at 20 minutes for 20 minutes at 30 degrees, exposed to ribonuclease to degrade anything that had not been incorporated, and then the sample is dissolved in detergent and mixed with streptavidin beads to precipitate MIR-220 biotinylated MIR-223, and then that sample processed on an SDS gel and blotted with the YBX1 antibody, and there it is, YBX1 is being carried in on MIR-223 into the vesicles that form in this reaction. And that incorporation uh, absolutely depended upon having cytosolic proteins present during the cell-free reaction, depended upon having membranes present during the cell-free reaction, was greatly reduced if the reaction was held on ice, and likewise, obviously, greatly reduced if the reaction didn't have biotinylated MIR-223 in the first place. Okay, so it's, it's going in, it's binding to MIR-223, it's becoming sequestered, but is it actually required? Is it a packaging factor that's essential to convey microRNAs into vesicles that form in, this, in the reaction, or better yet, in cells? So we used the now standard technique of CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out uh, both copies of the YBX1 gene in uh, HEC293 cells. The allele that we produced was a, um, uh, a frame shift mutation, a deletion that produced a frame shift. Uh, not enough to delete the whole gene, but certainly enough to uh, remove immunoreactive, immunodetectable YBX1 protein. The cells that are uh, homozygous mutant are, grow perfectly normally, uh, there's no obvious essential function for YBX1, but is it playing an essential role in the packaging of MIR-223? To evaluate this, we used two different experiments. The first is the cell-free reaction that I've been talking about. We obtained cytosol from wild-type and YBX1 mutant cells and asked, are these two cytosolic fractions active in forming sequestered luciferase, the biogenesis assay, uh, and are they active in packaging MIR-223 in the cell-free reaction? The results are shown here. On the left is the biogenesis reaction. Focus on these two bars. They show you that the YBX1 mutant cytosol is just as active as wild-type cytosol in packaging luciferase CD63 in a sequestered form compared to controls uh, held on ice. So that wasn't too surprising. Indeed, if you look at intact 
YBX1 null cells, they secrete just as many exosomes as detected by particle tracking analysis. There's no effect on removing that gene on the production of exosomes. However, as you see on the right, cytosol obtained from the YBX1 null is greatly reduced in the efficiency of packaging of MIR223 in vitro compared to two wild-type controls <coughs> if the YBX1 null cell is returned to near normal by introducing a, a, a fresh copy by stable transfection of the normal YBX1 gene, the cytosol obtained from such a transformant is restored, but not quite fully, to activity. So that now activity is, is uh, back up to about 70% of normal. OK, now that is a, the cell-free reaction. Let me emphasize that reaction is conducted for 20 minutes at 30 degrees. In order to assess whether intact cells have a defect in the secretion of this microRNA, we have to take a much longer time point, about a day or more, to collect enough material. And so uh, uh, a defect uh, that shows a profound lesion in a 20-minute incubation may not be quite so defective if you have to carry out the sample for 24 hours. And in fact, that, as you'll see, is the case um, and there's maybe a reason for it. It turns out that when you knock out, there are two other paralogs of YBX1 called YBX2 and 3. They're normally dormant in these cells. But if you knock out YBX1, the cells ramp up the uh, transcription of the YBX2 gene. And that may, at some level, compensate for the absence of YBX1. Here is a messenger RNA analysis showing you that the YBX1 null cell, in a vain effort to produce this defective protein, actually makes more of the mutant messenger RNA. Um, YBX2 and 3 are normally very poorly transcribed in wild-type cells. But look at this. When uh, YBX1 null cells are evaluated, there's a huge increase in the transcription of the YBX2 gene. Now, that gene is presumably being expressed, but the antibody that we have against the YBX1 protein is sufficiently different that it, the protein, that protein is not detected. So its, it's uh, sequence is conserved, but the epitopes are not. All right, so here's now an experiment that, show, that will show you that uh, after a sample taken after a day, there is a defect in the packaging of microRNAs. Uh, but it's a particular defect that requires for MIR223 that the YBX2 gene be knocked down as well as YBX1. Okay, so here's the result. Wild type cells, we've evaluated in this case two different microRNAs, MIR223 as before, and now this MIR144, which is also very highly enriched in exosomes. If you look at the YBX1 null cell by itself, uh, there's only about a 40% decrease in the efficiency of secretion of MIR-223, but MIR-144 is down about threefold. So just by itself, YBX1 seems to be required for MIR-144 secretion. If the YBX1 null cells are further exposed to siRNA to ablate the expression of YBX2, now these cells, though they produce exosomes just as abundantly as wild type, are quite defective in the secretion of both species of microRNA down by a factor of five. So clearly, YBX1, possibly with the help of YBX2, required for the secretion of these microRNAs, but not for the production of exosomes. OK, now the final question that I'll pose is, is there a signal on MIR223 that's required for its recognition and packaging in vitro? And uh, to, ask, to address this question, Matt uh, adopted a procedure that's been used for years now to uh, select RNA sequences that have particular features. It's a RNA evolution in the test tube called Selex, adapted in our case to our biogenesis pathway. Whoopsie. This must be so top secret that you can't see it. 
Okay, there we go. So it's called exo for exosome Celex. It's a variation on the cell-free reaction that I've told you about in, in, in a bunch of slides. Uh, but in this case, we start with uh, membranes and cytosol and ATP. And instead of adding MIR-223, we add a, a, hugely, a huge and random pool of RNA oligomers formed by chemical synthesis to have enormous complexity, hoping that the cell-free reaction will sift out from this complex mixture only those RNA sequences that have the right residues that can be recognized and packaged. So we're using the in vitro reaction to inform us of the right sequence. And that's done by conducting the incubation, processing the sample with ribonuclease, extracting the RNAs that survive, returning them by amplification to DNA templates, and then transcribing them all over again now with a refined pool. And this can be repeated over and over again. We did so four times in two independent replicates and evaluated which sequences were enriched and which sequences were depleted in the course of this in vitro evolutionary selection. Some sequences are enriched, others are depleted. David Melville, a postdoc in the lab, developed an algorithm to scan all these sequences, uh, to find, uh, scanning for octameric sequences, to look for those that may be enriched. And in the two replicates, the common element in both cases was a run of C residues. In one trial, a run of three C residues. In another trial, the most common element was a run of four C residues. And guess what? If you look at the sequence near the three prime end of MIR-223, sure enough, there are four C residues. Whereas if you look at the sequence of the cytoplasmic microRNA, MIR-190, not a single C residue. Well, that's uh, comforting, but uh, better yet, let's test whether that sequence is both necessary and sufficient to promote incorporation in the cell-free reaction. And so in the final experiment, Matt created chemical uh, derivatives of MIR-223 lacking C residue, shown here, or a derivative of MIR-190 equipped with three C residues near the three prime end. And he compared the efficiency of these variants to the efficiency of packaging of normal microRNAs. Here's the data for the last um, experiment that I'll show you. MIR-223, as before, quite nicely packaged compared to a sample held on ice, whereas now the mutant, very poorly packaged, um, if at all. MIR-190, very poorly packaged to begin with, but it's quite efficiently packaged now if it is equipped with three C residues near the, C, uh, near the three prime end. So a lot to do. Let me emphasize before you ask any questions, this is just one graduate student, so there are many obvious things that we need to do. I'm reminded uh, of the time in my lab now 20 years ago when we first developed a cell-free reaction that reproduced a significant aspect of the secretory pathway with isolated membranes and cytosol. There was a lot to do then, and a graduate student in the lab reviewing his contribution during a group meeting found a Gary Larson cartoon that depicted sort of where we were early experiments in transport, where uh, new graduate students called rotation students were strapped to the wheel of progress and sacrificed uh, <laughs> in the course of our um, discoveries. Here I am uh, standing aside taking notes. Um, we have a rotation student now back home doing some experiments, and I, I hope he survives the experience. <laughs> Let me summarize for you uh, some of the uh, simple lessons we've learned thus far. We believe that this process begins by the recognition of certain microRNAs uh, by RNA binding proteins, one example, YBX1. We think that um, these uh, then produce a ribonucleoprotein particle, and we think that the RNPs are somehow engaged by the machinery involved in the production of uh, vesicles that are housed in the interior of the endosome and which ultimately, in this case, uh, can be secreted outside of the cell. Now, I would caution uh, 
that it's also possible that some of the exosomes that we study are formed actually at the cell surface. There are enveloped RNA viruses that bud directly from the cell surface, and it's, it's equally plausible that everything that I've shown you is actually occurring at the cell surface rather than at an endosome. There's, that wouldn't affect any of the experiments that I've shown you, but the, the, the fact that we have a way of studying this in vitro a lot will allow us to figure out which membrane is engaged. We should be able to fractionate the membranes and see if it's actually a plasma membrane or an endosome. That is the template for this. That and all of the cytoplasmic proteins that participate in this are now revealed to us, and uh, ultimately we hope to be able to purify them. Well, let me conclude with the people who've done the work. Uh, I started uh, with the work of Hanukkah Bajaj, a postdoc, former postdoc in the lab. She's now a staff scientist at Genentech. She has been followed a quite ably by Amita Garur, who did our uh, correlative fluorescence electron microscopy Lin Yuan and Satoshi Baba, who've been able to reproduce the packaging of collagen into vesicles that bud in vitro. And now, um, a very talented graduate student, Matt Shirtliff, who is now just in his last year of graduate school, who's done all of our work on the packaging of microRNAs. Well, I think I've gone on for long enough, and now I think I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Just, just hold on for a second. We're going to be doing some moderating of the questions because we've got to have to have them texted from up downstairs. Um, but go ahead. Just have. <laughs> Dr. Sheckman, thank you. It's it's a great talk. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> There is a concept of the cell-to-cell -cell infection, and then that is uh, there are accumulating evidence in the neurodegenerative diseases. Yep. Let's say the monomers of the superoxide dismutase, and then also TDP40 that I am working on, the oligomer, oligomer forms are very, very um, toxic, so they have to form the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the aggregation. So do you think that these oligomers can be transported from cell to cell through the endosomes? Yeah. Everybody hear that question? Um, certainly that's a prominent view. Uh, there is evidence for lateral transfer of amyloid. There's uh, perhaps even the suggestion of lateral transfer of uh, Lewy bodies in, or in synucleinopathies, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, whether this happens by that kind of lateral conveyance, remains to be seen. It, can, it certainly can, it can be observed in cell culture. It could occur by the formation of, a, of an exosome that transports material to an adjacent cell, or it could occur by the formation of, a, of an ephemeral tubule that connects one cell to an adjoining cell, through which uh, cytoplasmic content may flow. Uh, those are all possible and attractive uh, opportunities uh, for investigation. Thank you, Dr. Shetman. Well, before taking more questions, I'm going to state a few rules here. So we have about 30 minutes for the Q&A session. Uh, for the first few minutes, we will take live questions from this room, and Dr. McCormick downstairs will moderate from AC100. And finally, we will take questions from the internet, given that this is a live telecast, so we will entertain questions on the net. So this room, go ahead. That's a question. Well, Dr. Shekman, I think I learned a lot. It was a so clever experiment design. So um, I would like to know the, the experiment, the exosome you obtained, basically experiment, largely uh, rely on the HAK cells, right? So my question is, is, the, is any tissue-specific exosome? That's the first question. My second question is, for example, the MIR-223, right? You identify that, looks like very specific. And is any downstream target already identified? Yeah, two good questions. Uh, the first is, um, of course, there's a huge literature showing exosomes produced by a variety of tissues and cells. <clears throat> We've now uh, started to look at a breast cancer cell tumor line and have found uh, two distinct vesicle species that can be resolved on a buoyant density gradient, one of which has uh, CD63 and the other which is marked by a different membrane protein. So they seem to be maybe only partially overlapping. We're now doing a 
uh, a deep seek microRNA analysis to see if they contain different microRNAs. Um, I think the same procedure should be applied to a variety of different cell cell cult, cell culture types to see what you know if there if there's a wide diversity of exosome species. Uh, and the second question, remind me, what was it? What's the target of the target? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, well, uh, so where do these vesicles go? Yeah. Is that the question? Well, of course, that's a that's an important question. Um, there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, so the microRNA. So MIR two twenty three has been implicated in um, cholesterol homeostasis. So there may be a target at, up uh, in front of the HMG coi reductase gene, but both MIR two twenty three and uh, YBX one also are known to be subject to stress regulation. So it, and it may be that you know for some reason the way we're growing the HEC two ninety three cells they are stressed. But we haven't changed the conditions of growth to see if if that alters the kinds of exosomes that are being produced, or their content of RNA. MIR-223 has also turned up as a, one of a kind of, you know, a group of microRNAs that is kind of a diagnostic of human lung cancer. So it's found, MIR-223 is found in the serum of patients with lung cancer. Whether it's actually housed in exosomes hasn't been demonstrated, but it was one of several that an Italian group found is more characteristic of lung cancer than of normal patients. So that's, of course, a, one of the most appealing things about uh, these studies, not, not ours, but the studies that suggest that these microRNAs may be used diagnostically, even if for whatever function they have, if they can be used diagnostically, it can obviously be a very sensitive assay to measure the, uh, the, the incidence and progression of, of things like cancer. So this, this may be a um, very naive question. <laughs> what defines the specific size of these uh, exosomes? Yeah. Um, well, um, it, it depends on how they're, how they're produced. In, in, in the production of uh, vesicles that bud into the interior of the endosome in, the, in this multivesicular body pathway, there is a machinery uh, that was first actually discovered in yeast by Scott Emmer. Uh, called the escort machinery. It's a series of complexes that polymerize on the surface of the endosome and then define a domain into which ubiquitolated membrane proteins that are about to be you know, swallowed up are, are, are segregated. And then uh, this vesicle is pinched from, its, from the lip of the membrane to form a relatively small vesicle in the interior of the endosome. And the size of that vesicle is likely dictated by the size of the ring that forms at the neck of the vesicle uh, of the invagination. And, and it's believed that depolymerization of that ring garrets the vesicle, constricts it, uh, and, and that the, probably the rate at which that occurs dictates its size. So it's a very different kind of mechanism than the, than the mechanism that, that I described at the outset, that where a coat la literally coats the surface of a bud. This coat actually does not coat the inner surface of the vesicle. It forms at the neck, uh, still facing the cytoplasm. And those escort subunits are recycled back into the cytoplasm. They're not actually sequestered in the vesicle in the interior. So, Dr. Sheckman, I have a question. Has anybody looked at the lipid composition of these vesicles? Given your purification method, allowing them to float on a sucrose gradient yeah. would be reminiscent of something like lipid rafts. Sure. That's some of us uh, well, people have done lipid analysis, but I caution that much of it is based on crude, a crude fraction. So I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not sure I would re would rely on that. Are uh, there any lipid or protein markers that one could sort of assign to it? Well, ceramide, ceramide so, biogenesis is required for the production of exosomes, um, and the protein markers are. I showed you a blot with several of them, CD63, CD81, CD9. Are these related in any way to lipid rafts and cavioli? Um, uh, I'm not aware of caviolin being associated with it. The caviolin buds vesicles into the cytoplasm, not into the interior of the endosome. So it's topologically the opposite right. of the way clathrin or COP1 or COP2 or, cla or, or what, cavioli what flotillin? Work. Flotillin. Well, I showed a, a blot. Yes, I saw Maybe it's blot. slipped by. Flotillin is associated with vesicles uh, 
extracellular vesicles that co-purified through the sucrose step gradient, but which did not bind to the immobilized CD63. So that may represent a distinct exosome species. You know, that could be isolated and its composition studied. But again, you know, until now, people have looked at relatively crude fractions. Thank you. So I'm going to apologize in advance if this is a dumb question. <laughs> um, but I noticed when uh, you did the experiment where you had the cDNA library and then made the RNAs to see maybe what was being packaged in the mm -hmm. exosome, mm -hmm. was that a, kind of a two-parter question? Um, was that all human cDNA samples, or were there viral or other types of the, organisms? There was no, no species whatsoever. It was completely a random oligomer okay. formed you know, you know, chemically. And were uh, any of them identified as maybe like small bits that might be in like viruses? I ask that because this seems to me like it might be a great way for a cell to boot a virus out um, as maybe a protection mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, those are, you're, those are both reasonable, and, but they're sort of different. Uh, the, the, react, the experiment you're referring to is a, is a purely synthetic uh, a, 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 a process that, that we use to, uh, uh, where we use the, the cell-free reaction to identify for us the, the nucleotide sequences that are preferred for packaging. The RNA that we added was not biological RNA, it was purely chemically synthetic RNA. But, you re but the second point that you make is, is absolutely a valid one, and, and, and that is that maybe these exosomes, are, their function is to pick out RNAs from the cytoplasm and just get rid of them. And that's perfectly plausible. Um, maybe it's, they're doing both things. Maybe there's a negative function associated with exosome uh, export or, uh, and also a positive function. And that remains to be seen. There's a very active field of investigation where people take exosomes and they mix them with cultured cells or they inject them into animals to see what they may do. And uh, there have been biological effects reported. But again, I'm, I'm cautious about these uh, because they mostly use crude material. Is there any relationship with the YBX1 protein and the Dicer Argonaut machinery, like yeah. a competition or something? Yeah, that? no, that's a, that's a great question. Were, were you a referee on this paper? <laughs> um, we did not find Dicer or Argonaut in our uh, streptavidin pull-down experiments. Further, we did with an antibody against Argonaut, we don't see it in exosomes. So it, um, for technical reasons, we may have missed its presence. Uh, or our view now, but we still have more work to do, our view is that there may be some competition. Argonaut may form. It, it forms apparently as an obligate intermediate in the maturation of single-stranded mi microRNA, but it may be displaced for those microRNAs that are going to be packaged. And it may be that YBX1 displaces Argonaut. Um, we, we're, we're now considering that possibility. One more question, uh, Dr. Sheckman. So if these uh, aggregated proteins possibly can be transported by exosomes, how the exosomes can recognize these uh, toxic proteins? Is there any kind of yeah. recognition mechanism? Or okay, you have yeah. a sequence, yeah. get in, I'll yeah. transport yeah. it. That's a good question. Um, um, I mentioned very briefly that in this process where cell surface receptors are uh, delivered from after they're you know sort of down regulated they're delivered to the endosome and if they persist in a ubiquital ubiquitilated form they are recognized by the escort machinery and gathered in and then internalized so one way to package aggregates or amyloid would be if they were if one or more of the subunits in an aggregate was uh, ubiquitilated it might then be recognized by one or another element of the escort machinery and then dragged along into the interior uh, of a vesicle. How does it differ from the uh, proteosomes? Yeah, that's proteosomes a good, yeah. Proteosomes right. Yeah. 
Right. So, so that's, of course, a, a, a challenging question. Why, why is amyloid not degraded by the proteasome? Well, amyloid uh, aggregates may, may some, by the time they're, they're big enough to be secreted, uh, may be too big to be degraded by the proteasome. So this may simply be another way of getting rid of them, either by packaging them for delivery to the lysosome or packaging for expulsion from the cell. And the, the, unfortunately, the consequence of packaging them for expulsion from the cell may be their lateral spread to other cells. Uh, the one of the first part is what is the function of pre collagen the vesicle? Do you think it's one uh, clearance system to protect the cell under the stress condition, such like uh, autophagy, something? The, the, ve the vesicles that I showed you in fluorescence and electron microscopy are not um, disposal vesicles. These are biogenesis vesicles. They're COP2 coated transport vesicles that mediate the traffic of all uh, secretory proteins and membrane proteins that move from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus. So it's an obligate intermediate in the normal traffic pathway. In this case, it's been adjusted to allow a larger carrier to accommodate procollagen. All right, we'll take some questions from AC100. Dr. McCormick, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank All you. Right. I'll uh, hand it over to you. OK, thank you. Let's thank see you. if our audience has any questions. Uh, they've been pretty attentive. Hold on. I see no questions, but can I ask one? That was an excellent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sheckman. I'm looking at it from the layman's point of view. Uh, what, what do you think, if you look at this 10 years from now, will be the significance of this in clinical practice? Well, um, uh, there are many, many clinical applications of uh, what I talked about. One, one that is um, probably most um, immediately accessible is the use of the uh, of exosomes and their RNA content uh, for diagnostic purposes. <clears throat> I mentioned <coughs> that um, there are studies published that show uh, one of them that we've been studying is um, a marker for uh, human lung cancer. So, and since it's an RNA, if this turns out to be an early marker that w one before any pathological evidence could be obtained, then uh, you can imagine having very early diagnostic tests. Uh, and since it's an RNA, it can be amplified. So a very, it, it would provide an opportunity for very sensitive tests. Uh, and if the RNAs change during the course of disease, it may be an opportunity to monitor progression by just taking blood samples. So that would be incredibly valuable. Now, if these vesicles turn out to be uh, an important uh, the means uh, by which tumors metastasize, as has been speculated, then attacking the vesicles by some kind of immune approach might, um, uh, might greatly delay the progression of, uh, of cancer. So there have been several reports suggesting that these uh, exosomes produced by a primary tumor cell migrate in the body uh, and um, create a pre-metastatic niche into which uh, primary tumors may uh, migrate by metastasis. And uh, if you could intervene to prevent that by uh, blocking, soaking up these vesicles, then that could be a powerful approach. And uh, that would be wonderful if we're true. Thank may you so much. Uh, does anyone else from the audience have any questions? Anybody? Well, our audience is being very shy today, so maybe we'll turn it back down downstairs, okay? Thank you. Randy, you, you've studied this, in, I guess, in uh, human cell lines. It, is this conserved in yeast? There, yeah, there's a report of exosomes in, in yeast, but you know, I'm not quite sure why yeast cells. I mean, yeast cells have a thick cell wall what, what, what would be the point of it? Um, 
So there's one report. You can, if you cut thin sections, you can see vesicles between the plasma membrane and the inner layer of the cell wall. Uh, I, I'm a little dubious mm -hmm. about it. Will you think the microRNA pack in the exon can act kind of as a signal? Because the exon could yeah. be taken up by the neighboring cells sure. or other cells. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, that's um, lots of people are, are progressing uh, with that idea. Um, and uh, I think it remains to be, I think there are some, even some papers that make this claim. But again, let me emphasize, uh, most people who have studied this are working, uh, work with a crude exosome fraction. And, and, and let me be more specific about why that's a problem. If you take the crude exosome fraction and you put it on a sucrose density gradient and you look across the gradient for the distribution of RNA, you find that all of, almost all of the RNA that you detect is that in, the, in a pellet fraction at a density higher than 60% sucrose, whereas the exosome vesicles are buoyant, they float. And so the culture medium for cells you know, has RNPs in it that are not bound up in vesicles. And yet people take this crude stuff and they inject it into an animal and they make claims about what it, you know, exosomes doing something. So I, you, know, you can see why I'm skeptical. If, if the purified vesicles that we have can be shown to exert some control of gene expression in a, you know, you know, uh, by you know, looking very specifically at the effect of MIR-223 on a target sequence in a neighboring cell, I'll be persuaded. But until then, I'm skeptical. I will just take the chance. Okay, um, um, you, your early study already, I mean, that's helped the whole world, like the secretion of insulin, right? So is the exosome secretion pathways quite common, like insulin um, synthesize a secretion pathway? Is the same or not? And also, well, other protein was also secreted by yeah. exosome or yeah. not? So, of course, these two pathways are quite independent of one another. So insulin is, is secreted by a standard secretory pathway where it's enclosed within the lumen of the ER and conveyed to the Golgi, et cetera, within intracellular vesicles. This is a, this is a pathway topologically the, the reverse of the secretory pathway where a vesicle buds into the interior of an organelle and then is, is exported. So it's, it's swallowing up cytoplasmic content. So microRNAs that are secreted don't ever have to cross a biological membrane in order to be secreted from cells, whereas insulin has to be translocated through a channel in the ER membrane. So it's a completely different pathway. There were some reports of uh, MIR-223 att uh, attracting neutrophils. Um, really? Good science, do you think that's more of a reflection in the media it's, it was in then? I, I'm not aware of that, but um, I'd be curious to see how, you know, how, how it's doing that. I mean, MIR-223 could well have a, an intracellular function as well, at least, but in HEC-293 cells, there's almost no MIR-223 that you can even find. I mean, that was amazing. You know, most of it is packaged into, into exosomes, at least. It's kind of reported with tuberculosis. Is that right? Yeah. Hmm. Well, maybe it's exosomes uh, with MIR-223 that are binding to tubercul tubercular bacteria. That would be cool if that were true. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of that study. So we have one internet question. Is there a role of organellar membranes, such as ER membrane and Golgi membranes, in the genesis of exosome? Um, uh, you possibly. That's, a, that's really an interesting question. Um, uh, certain viruses, like, like hepatitis B, bud into the interior of the ER, and then the, the virus flows along the secretory pathway to be exported. So it is possible that some exosomes bud into the interior of the ER or bud into the interior of the Golgi. No one has ever considered that possibility, but, it's, but it has precedent in enveloped RNA viruses. So that, that actually is a cool question. Because when you guys lysed your cells, you separated the membranes and the cytosol. You didn't take care of the organellar. Absolutely. Membranes. And as I mentioned at the very end, uh, what we want to do uh, is, starting with that crude membrane fraction, you know, separate it into different fractions on various gradients, and then assay 
different membrane fractions for their uh, activity in this sequestering assay. And we'll see. You know, if it's the ER, it's the ER. I mean, you know, that's the beauty of this is that uh, you, don't have to pr you don't have to make any um, intelligent guesses. You just do the experiment. Did in the uh, uh, when your preps when you made your preps, did you notice any heterogeneity in the exosomes in their size or? Uh, yes, after? yes. If you look at the crude fraction, it's quite heterogeneous in size in the membranes. Uh, as you uh, purify them, uh, they become more homogeneous around you know eighty to one hundred nanometers in diameter. And that's, but is that, that's from the cell, I'm talking about when you make them, when oh, you Oh, in vitro. Them, in vitro. Ah, okay, well that, that's tough. That's really tough. We haven't actually isolated the vesicles that are made in vitro. And uh, it, that, I mean, we thought about it, but it's really tough because we're starting with a crude extract with lots of membranes, which may form vesicles that have nothing to do with what we're trying to study. And the vesicles that we are studying could be very minor components of this gamish of membranes. So technically, that would be a very challenging experiment that one of the referees requested that we do and which we will politely <laughs> decline to do. Um, do you have any idea what is the phenotype of that YBX um, knockout mice or like the expression level of the YBX in the cell? Because with the idea that there may be one microRNA in one um, exosome, that seems like there will be a need of a lot of uh, expression of YBX yeah. in the cell. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Uh, we haven't done anything uh, to address that. I, I imagine someone out there has made a YBX1 null mouse. I'm not aware of it. Um, I gave us a, a talk on this trip at MD Anderson, and my host asked me if, if, if there are any uh, uh, tumors that have mutations in the YBX1, and I, I said I didn't know, but he sent me an email uh, two days ago showing me that there were some papers reporting uh, tumors that alter the expression of YBX1. So when I have a moment, I'll go and look at those papers. Um, YBX1 has turned up in the literature in many different functions. It's found bound to uh, pre-messenger RNA uh, splicing junctions. It, so it, it could have um, different functions, not only in this event. Um, but as I said, you know, our experiment's very limited about its function. The knockout that we made, the cells grow perfectly normally. Well, if there are no further questions, let's thank Dr. Shackman one more time. So um, we, uh, um, we're going to ask everybody's forbearance here. We, we have uh, several awards to give, the first of which is, is Dr. Hahn is going to give Dr. Sheckman uh, an award. Uh, then we have the student presentations. Well, I was talking to Dr. Sheckman last night and um, asked, as he was traveling the country and the world after the Nobel Prize, what he was receiving as, um, as gifts at various sites. And he said he has a, a great collection of pens and laser pointers. <laughs> the, the good news is there's no laser pointer here. <laughs> but there is a pen. <laughs> and as you know, this is our centennial year. We, we've just renovated our, our administration building, which was opened 100 years ago. And we repurposed some of the wood from the, uh, from the uh, administration building. And we have a Kansas City University pen made out of the wood from the administration building that you can keep in your pen collection. Thank you. There, there's that. But we also have something that I know you don't have. Um, Dr. Johnston, our... our um, our vice dean from the medical school is, um, is a baseball fanatic, and I, I think that you spoke with him a little bit yesterday, and I know that you're a Dodger fan. 
This has nothing to do with the Dodgers, though. <laughs> in Kansas City, we have a team as well. And yes. And we, we, we won a little championship this, this past year. And we have a commemorative, we have a commemorative, uh, I've got it open now, Waterford Crystal Whoa. paperweight, which, which is an official, it's a numbered paperweight, Waterford Crystal, champions, Kansas City Royals, 2015, and if you could put this next to your Dodger collection, we'd, we'd sure appreciate that. It, um, I have to say, because of the surface structure, that it looks like a COP2 vesicle. And, and I thought that myself uh, <laughs> as we purchased that. <laughs> and let, let me package this up, and Jeff, I'm going to turn this back over to you. I'm sorry. I'm going to have a couple of first photographs. Okay, sure, sure. So, um, uh, Dr. Zhao, uh, Dr. Zadie, would you please join me? Dr. Parrott, would you come down? Uh, Dr. Seidler. Um, and um, we are going to start with the uh, uh, awards. Uh, and we are going to go first with the Dr. Seidler Awards. So I'm going to ask Dr. Seidler uh, to present it. And then we'll have photographs, so it'll take us a few minutes. What a great day of intellectual nourishment. <laughs> a little shout out for uh, Dr. Joyce, who has been uh, very implemental in uh, moving our research uh, efforts forward. <laughs> Five presentations were all excellent. You are all winners. But there's only one awardee. <laughs> and the awardee is Nicolina Taylor Smith. Thank you so much. Okay, so you have to come on. We have oh, lots of, of photos. Okay. Uh, with me first, then with Dr. Who, we're going to get everybody in. So All right. We'll do it. Where am I looking? Do you want to do two sets? What, what's going to be for a photographer? What do you want to do? Okay, all right, yes. Okay, um, I, they're from the 45 posters. I think we have a lot of excellent ones, but again, we can have two or one? One, okay. Or first place? Okay, the first place is for uh, Sedra Shahaka. And, and just to let you know, um, Shanisha got the second place poster award. <laughs> uh, we don't have a certificate for that one, but we 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 yeah, we'll, 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 we there is a check. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, uh, Sarah, would you like to give this last one? As a member of the Betty Jo White um, 
Award for Osteopathic Research. It is my pleasure to present this to Dr. Zhou, and we really appreciated your presentation today. Thank you so much. Thank you.